So it's now recording. First of all, welcome to everybody who's here. It, and I just want to say, in addition to a brief introduction, uh, the type of information that instructors who have actually talked about this and the FAA required you to know prior to any flight in the vicinity of Sterling Airport. It's interesting um, because one of the other things we talked about and, oh Lord, I have to figure out. There we go. Um, is for students to don't forget to bring your logbook and your student syllabus progress sheet to the airport for your flying lessons. That's not part of this weather briefing, but I figured I'd throw it in because it's the start of the season and it's easy for to forget. What, what is the student syllabus progress sheet? That's that colored sheet with like five columns of sign off on little initials and check marks that have like, uh, we did steep turns, we did uh, incipient stalls, things like that. Uh, you if can... you're not sure, it's there's usually a copy of it in the uh, green shed, or you can download it. Uh, Tony, where is it located in the student page? It's on it's on the uh, student website, the header page. It's on and it's a uh, click uh, on the appropriate box on the left side. Okay, it's thank right you. there. All right, so <clears throat> this is what the FAA says that a pilot in command shall before beginning a flight, become familiar with all available information concerning that flight. They specify, and I excerpted this for gliders, so I left out the IFR and some other things. This information must include for a flight not in the vicinity of the airport, weather reports and forecasts, and for any flight, runway lengths at airports of intended use, uh, and other reliable information appropriate to the aircraft relating to its performance and so forth, such as its gross weight, wind and temperature, and so forth. Those actually are applicable to Sterling Airport because, for example, the winds aloft on Saturday are expected to be fairly high. So the aircraft weight, if you're flying a K-21, will behave differently than if you're flying the 126, which I would personally not fly uh, on Saturday because of the expected winds aloft. Now, some of the information in here, like not in the vicinity of the airport, weather reports and forecasts is sort of interesting because how do you know what the winds aloft are in the vicinity of the airport that you're flying out of if you don't check the weather for, uh, forecasts and the winds aloft and so forth. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, when you come to the field to fly in the vicinity, meaning basically instruction, I would like to think that you could answer these questions. What's the weather like today? You know, What's it gonna be? How's it gonna change? What can we expect for ground and winds aloft and direction? Because they may or may not change with height. Which runway should we use as a result? And if there are crosswinds, what should we be concerned about? How specifically will the weather change today? Will it be good this morning, lousy this afternoon? Will there be gusts late, later this afternoon and so forth? Are there any notams and TFRs we should be concerned about? That's part of all available information. And yes, sometimes there are NOTAMs in TFRs that reach into the Sterling area. It's rare, but it does happen. And then also, what are the soaring conditions like for today? And um, that may be more for the advanced student, a little bit less so. Um, I, I would not expect a pre-solo student to necessarily be able to answer that. But there is some good information to be gleaned uh, by checking what the soaring conditions for the day might be. And for this particular tutorial, we are gonna follow what I sent out in the email. We'll talk about quick weather, just a quick look, National Weather Service and a Fitchburg site that I use. You're welcome to use it or not. Uh, these are all suggestions along the lines of what I personally think as an instructor you should have under your belt when you come to the field. A little bit more detailed, I look at windy for winds aloft and what the trends might be as a function of time and direction, particularly 
re with relation to the orientation of the runway. And I'll show you how that happens. Getting serious, we will look at it, uh, the METAR and the TAF. And for that, I use Worcester, understanding it's about 10 miles south of us and 500 or so feet higher than us. So the winds can be a little different, but it gives you an indication. Unofficial NOTAMs and TFRs, checking a, uh, the TFR FAA website that does list NOTAMs and TFRs, and then officially TFRs and NOTAMs by either calling WX Brief or what I personally do is I have a login to wxbrief.com website, and that's the one I will show you on uh, this tutorial. And then to answer the question, is it sorable today? I tend to use GBSC RASP and SkySight. And I can be skeptical of both of them because last year, for example, many times, I don't know, maybe toward the end of the summer, for some reason, SkySight was predicting terrible soaring conditions when in fact they were pretty good and didn't match GBSC RASP, but, but I still look at them to get a balanced view. Do you, Fred, do you have a, uh, a uh, an account there, a paid account, or you just use the free sources? With, SkySide, uh, sorry. I think I pay for it. So, yeah, I, I actually don't remember. So does it make a difference? Well, it's 89 bucks a month, and you get more information. Oh. Uh, you, sorry, $89 a year. I was going to say, for 90 <laughs> bucks a month, I, I am definitely and, not paying and, for that. And you get m much more information. Whether okay. or not it's worth it to you is up to you. There is, a, uh, I think, a three-week trial period that you can sign up for, or something along those lines, Yeah. see if it's worth it to you. Later this summer, uh, I was talking to Mike Newman, and he has some thoughts about we should be teaching a whole lot more about RASP, the GBSE RASP and the SkySight and weather fronts and weather maps and so forth. And I suggested that for this basic introduction, it was too much. And I would not expect a student, especially a beginning student coming to the airport to have that information. So when I talk about GBSE RASP and SkySight, it will be very basic. Okay, so let's kill that. And let's go to our first thing on the list, which is, and I'm going to screen share again here to here. And I hope you can see that, that I am screen sharing the National Weather Service basic uh, weather for Sterling. Got it. And it's it says Fitchburg Municipal Airport, but in fact, it uh, is two miles southwest uh, for Sterling, Mass. I This is sort of my go-to, hey, what's it going to be like for the week? And as you can see, Saturday and Sunday look pretty pathetic. Friday looks pretty good. I can kind of get a sense real quick. I, I expect every student to be able to take a real quick look at this and say, hey, Friday we're flying uh, uh, foggy before, say, 7 a.m., mostly sunny, high of 63, light and variable. These are all things I like to read, and, and I'm happy with light and variable becoming southeast, which says to me we're probably using runway 16 um, to, and see what the weather is like actually at the airport. Uh, the concern, however, is showers are likely mainly after 3 p.m. on Saturday, so it might be flyable in the morning. 60% chance of rain is not good and Sunday, 70%. Uh, and one thing that I like to look at on these, other than that, is actually this list here. And for now, I'm just going to kill the dew point, the heat index. I'm going to kill all of these. I'm <coughs> going to say, what's the weather like Friday? And I'll start at 6 a.m., so it's early. And this gives me a little bit better sense of what they're predicting for weather. And so as you can see, clouds are increasing uh, during the day. Uh, so probably about 11 a.m. they're saying that the clouds are gonna be there and I'm gonna assume those are more like thermal clouds. So those are cues and they increase through the afternoon. Part of this is Saturday, we're looking at 25% in the morning towards 60% in later in the afternoon with heavy, cloud cover all day long. I look at the temperature trends and I kind of look at the, the winds, although there's other sources that are better for the wind that I'll show you in a second. 
this again, just gives me the quick overview. You know, is it flyable Friday? Yes. Is it going to be flyable Saturday? Maybe in the morning, but I don't have enough information on that yet. And those are good things to know. And by the way, for all the other instructors and people here, feel free to chime in because this is an online tutorial and I'm not the expert, but it is my opinion. Anybody wants to chime in? Okay, let's kill okay, that. This I, is Robbie. I, do have one I wanted to say. On say again. I do have one question on the uh, yep. uh, previous page. Yeah. Um, you, some sites, some areas have ceiling and visibility available in the hourly graphs, which I did see available there, but you didn't click them. Was that on purpose? Yeah, I'm just showing some very basic stuff for introductory students. I mean, maybe up to about pre-solo and then uh, post-solo, especially since post-solo, you mm -hmm. might be thermally more there might be more information that you need. So I'm just, I kicked off a lot of that information and I just showed the basics of things you should be aware of coming out to the airport. That again, my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's one of the few places where I find, you know, taps don't go out very far. They give ceilings and visibilities. Uh, yes. but that one will go, that one will go out further than a tap. And it, you know, yes. Can, can yes. We, fly? we know it'll be overcast, but can we fly? Yes, yes. Um, the other side I actually like to look at because it gives me a little bit better trend. I'm gonna blow this up so I can read it better. I hope you can read it better too. Is This is a, a Fitchburg based uh, weather report. And so for example, I'm gonna, I look at it and I say, well, we launch at about 11 and we might fly until about five. So these three columns here, 21% clouds, 46%, 78%. What's the temperature? Okay, I'm not going to freeze to death, but it's not going to be particularly warm, low 60s. Where is the wind coming from? 100, 120, 120. That definitely says runway 16. And the average wind speed uh, is maybe five to six miles per hour. And please keep in mind that's in miles per hour. Uh, maximum wind gusts in miles per hour, not much more. So basically what they're saying is there's not much gusting going on. I can scan down and I can say, okay, uh, what is the cloud base at 60% coverage? And it turns out that it isn't really 60% 60, 60 coverage until at least 5 p.m. at night. Before that, uh, the cloud base is going to be between 10 and 24K uh, AGL. That's based on uh, Fitchburg. And that's good because that indicates there will be clouds. And um, I'm going to hope that those are cues, but we can look at SkySight and some other things to find out what the possibility of soaring are. Visibility is excellent. So there's, you know, it's not going to be any obscurations. It's definitely VFR, no chance of precipitation. And the rest of these don't matter because they are all about precipitation, dew point, and so forth. That gives me a little bit better sense of by the hour or the, by the three hours, what's going on. Uh, if you want to look at Saturday and Sunday, this only goes out about three days or so. Uh, Saturday, average wind speeds are higher. Uh, gusts are higher. Ceiling is quite a bit lower after about, uh, looks like 2 p.m. or so, it starts decreasing. It's certainly, if this is correct and doesn't change much, it'll be flyable, at least as far as the ceiling, till about later afternoon, and then the ceiling comes down, and I'm sure at that point you get substantial rain. Um, however, that's the 60% coverage of the sky. We have clouds on another layer, uh, at 2944, 2,300. That basically says to me, uh, you know, this 2,000 is a little worrisome. Uh, that's at 11 o'clock in the morning on Saturday because that could imply that we're not flying at all or just doing basic pattern work to 1,000 feet or so. But there's other factors that have to be considered as well. Uh, this is going to be something to watch right here. Visibility is good. Marginal VFR. That's interesting at, uh, what time is that? Eight o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry, 11 o'clock in the morning. I was looking at the wrong column. On Saturday, something to watch for. Chance of precipitation increases abruptly between about 11 and two. And by later afternoon, it 
I would say there's a pretty darn good chance we're going to be in vain. So that again gives me some general information. Now, let's get just a little bit more specific unless somebody has questions on this and how I'm using it. Okay, moving to Wendy. This is Wendy. I actually like Wendy. Uh, part of the reason I like Wendy is because you can blow it up and it shows the airport. And if Wendy's I Wendy's very accurate. I mean, you can put a wind picker on there just like you're doing there and you can yeah. change the different altitudes. I, I like Wendy for that reason. So, yeah. you know, this is the area we use for instruction and take off and hanging around the area and stuff. So tomorrow, assuming we launch at 11 o'clock or so, the winds are seven knots. They're going to be cross at, at uh, the surface. and The surface is over here on the right. And that to me says we're not only using one six, uh, but there's probably going to be curl over from the hills over on this side of the runway and so forth. Probably not a lot because the winds are actually relatively light. So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at Saturday, yeah. Friday. I'm sorry. You're right. Okay, 11 a.m., same issue, but six knots, lighter winds. And if I go a little bit later in the day and say how they're going to shift and go to like three or four o'clock, they're going to shift a little bit more south, uh, which is fine. It still means we're using one, one, runway one six. This gets a little bit more interesting when you click over here and you say, what if we go up to let's say 3,000 feet, which is kind of a typical tow height. You see they're 13 knots south uh, east aligned. Well, maybe not quite southeast because north is this way. So uh, east, easterly, southeasterly, 13 knots, that's not anything to worry about. Uh, if you are in the 126, sure, you can probably fly up here, but just be aware you got a 13 knot headwind to come back into the runway. Fred, I, I didn't see how you went uh, up to 3,000. What, what did you adjust to, to see? Okay, way over on the right, there's yeah. a slider bar. You see the uh, slider? Okay. Yeah. And I have that set for 3,000 feet. Okay. So let's also, take a look you at... You can change the southeast to uh, actually compass headings, uh, like 260, 160, or whatever. Yes, you can. Um, it makes, you know, it's just instant. You know, it gives there's you a lot of different. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would suggest anybody who's watching this tutorial just go into these things and play with it, because there's a lot of different things you can look at here for clouds and air. Well, air quality, not that we care about, but you know, there's more information here and down here that you can look at for different predictions. Let's go back down to ground level, and take a look at Saturday. Now here's Saturday, 11 o'clock. It's not too bad. It's seven knots. Let's look at three or four o'clock. Well, we're still at about 11 knots. Again, not too bad. But here's the kicker. Let's go back to 11 a.m. and go up to 3,000 feet. Um, oh, 9, 10, 11 a.m., 29 knots. That is fundamentally, from my sense as an instructor, too high. And then I look at it and I think, well, clearly there's a 20 knot wind gradient between 3000 feet and ground level. And so the question is, where is it maybe reasonable that we can do at least pattern toes or something? So let's put this down to, uh, here's 2,500. Oh. There's 2,000 feet, it's 17 knots. That's probably manageable in the uh, heavier gliders. I would not want a student in a 126 flying in that because if they got over into the Northern area, the Northwest areas of the airport, uh, it would be challenging to get back to the airport without good situational awareness. Those are things that I look at. Let's look at, uh, I don't know, three or four o'clock. At 2,000 feet, it's over 20 knots. That's pretty high for any sort of instruction, uh, pattern toes or anything. At 3,000 feet, it's pushing over 30 knots. So while the day might be flyable, <clears throat> and honestly, sometimes you have to make a flight in the morning to figure out what it's really like in Sterling, 
based on what's really happening there at our ground level. This doesn't look good. Uh, Sunday looks even worse. So I'm just going to leave it at that and say, hey, I use this to get a sense of where the wind's coming from. How is it aligned with the runway? What is it in the upper levels and so forth? Anybody else want to contribute? Fred, is this the free version of the premium? This is the free. And and I would just add that now this is Thursday night, so people should be aware that they should check this Friday night for Saturday. And Saturday oh, absolutely. Morning. Kathy, right. that's actually an excellent point. I mean, I hope to leave for the airport by about a quarter to eight, eight o'clock tomorrow morning. I will be up at 6.15, and by about 6.45, I will be doing all of this that I'm showing you. I will be looking at it for what is it for Friday? And for Saturday, I will do exactly the same thing because things can change pretty quickly. So you should do this the morning that you're planning on flying. Excellent point, Kathy. Okay. You, Fred, do you actually, uh, while you're at the, at, at the airfield, do you continually update yourself in terms of what it is up there? I mean, I, I take it some of this is, can change fairly quickly. Um, no, generally I do not. <clears throat> if there's something that is changing quickly or if there's an indication that I think it's going to change quickly, I will use my iPhone and check some of these things. But by and large, no. Uh, what I might check, however, is I do have an app on my phone that's Aero Weather, and I will check the TAF out of the terminal area forecast out of Worcester. Uh, and I know other people check other sites as well. Uh, so if I think would, something would, is would changing. Would you mind including some of those apps for us? Yes. I'm going to yes. download. I can okay. send them. I can send out what I use. Okay. Uh, Arrow Weather is, uh, works on Android too, and it's free, okay. and it's it's well worthwhile. Arrow Weather? Arrow Weather, yeah. Yes. Weather, yeah. All okay. one word. And it, it gives you basically uh, local weather for the a particular airport. And, yes. You know, it, it's just a... a an overview with not any not any detail. Of, well, just a quick, quick and dirty. Yeah, it, okay. it could tell you like showers in the vicinity, for example. Okay. You know, um, when you pull up the Aviation Weather Center, you get this map. But if you scroll down, you re you get this request METAR data, and I'm going to put in KORH, which is Worcester. Most importantly, I'm going to check decoded because I don't remember half the raw numbers. And I'm gonna say, include the terminal area forecast. And even though you say click METAR data, you will get the TAF and here it is. So here's the METAR. The METAR actually for me is not that useful because what the METAR is telling you is what's the weather like right now? But it's six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. That's not useful. I wanna know what the weather's gonna be like at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock or one o'clock. And that's where the terminal area forecast comes in. So the thing you have to remember is that in the terminal area forecast, UTC is four hours ahead of us. So this is not useful. This goes till- It's what? actually five hours right now because of- uh, uh, Daylight uh, savings time. Daylight savings, savings, savings time, thank you. So this is 2 a.m. in the morning, that doesn't help. This goes from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Okay, this goes to- 7 a.m. Still not useful, but this starts to become useful from 7 a.m. forward, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, you can expect east-southeast winds at 110 degrees at seven miles an hour, six knots, uh, six or more mile of uh, statute mile visibility, uh, at least 12,000 feet of uh, for a ceiling and scattered clouds at 25,000. Now. There's two reasons to look at this. First of all, it gives you verification for some of the things you looked at, for example, on Windy, that said about 100 degrees, 110 in those areas and about seven miles an hour. You know, this verifies all that. Now they are pulling off from essentially the same database, but sometimes you do get slightly different readings. So it's important to look at this. If we're doing regular flying during the day, 6, 8, 6 p.m. may be enough. Um, on the other hand, if we're doing 
uh, Thursday evening group or the evening group for instruction. I will look a little bit later in the day to see how it's shifting. And here it's shifting a little bit further south. The winds are picking up just slightly, nothing to worry about. Ceiling's still good, visibility is still good and so forth and so forth. So what I actually do is I come up here and I print this page off. And then on the right hand side here, I will write notes to myself about what I have learned so far about the weather, including some things that are coming up about TFRs, which runway we're using, visibility, notams, anything like that that's coming up. Uh, and even write myself a note like, pay attention to this at four o'clock because it may be a wind shift or something like that. So this is what I actually bring to the field with notes on it to verify to myself that I've done this. Anybody? UTC again is? Universal Coordinated Time. Time Coordinated, that's the Greenwich Mean Time. Oh, it's Greenwich. Um, yeah. Okay. And so yeah. if you're not sure what the offset is, just Google current UTC time and compare it to the current time that you're at. Okay. You know, in other words, Eastern Standard or Eastern Daylight Savings Time, and that's the shift you have to apply. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Can, can we double check what the offset is right now? Because I heard nominations for five hours and oh, I don't... My, minus, minus four. Uh, yeah, okay. I thought it was four. Uh, it turns out UTC does not switch to Daylight Savings Time, but Great Britain does. So Linda, for example, my wife is working in Worcester, England, where they are supposed to be on UTC time, but they're actually five hours because they switch to daylight savings time like we do. So it's, you just got to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, let's go to, let's kill this. and go to the next site, which is the FAA site. And this site is <clears throat> um, NOTAMs and other material. It usually is correct, but it may not be fully updated. Um, I haven't, I've only seen a couple instances where it didn't have the notums in that we needed to be aware of or, or anything that we needed to be aware of, uh, but it can be. And that's why in the end, we will check the uh, FAA WX brief site. Now, there's way too much information here. So let's just select a state. And since we're flying in instruction, we're gonna select Massachusetts. We're gonna say go. And lo and behold, the one notum shows up and says, uh, the Hanover Mass uh, always has a uh, notum there. You can click on it right over here, what the notum number Iowa is, factory. and it, it'll tell you what it is. And if you actually do a little investigation, what you find is that's the ex uh, explosives deposition, or uh, uh, what do you call it, the site where they get rid of explosives. And it's almost always there. I don't think I've maybe once seen that notum not there, but we don't fly down that way. So it's sort of a moot point. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, there are, according to this, no other notums that we need to be worried about. We'll double check that. There are intermittent TFRs too, so. Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing you can do is go to the site here, and this one will show TFRs as well. It, uh, and we can go to, again, we can go to Massachusetts, say go. And there's Hanover. There's, um, what is that? Uh, um, Probably uh, Devon's. Devons, Fort Devons, uh, which goes up, I think, uh, to about two or 3,000 feet. So if you're higher than that, you don't have to worry about it, but you should pay attention to it. I never really fly up that way on purpose, so I kind of go north and west. But that's another thing to check. Okay, any questions on this? All right. All right, flight services. Um, this is wxbrief.com. 1-800-WXBrief.com. You can see it right here. 
in the title. And this is the legal way to prove that you have checked NOTAMs and TFRs and so forth, because your keystrokes and other information are recorded. If you don't have an account, create an account. I happen to have one because this is what I use all the time. So let me log in. I believe you need at least a student pilot's license in order to uh, be eligible for an account. That may have changed. Also, one other legal way is uh, you can actually do a flight brief on your iPad. Yes, you can. I don't subscribe to that service. Um, uh, there are other services that you can subscribe to that I know some power pilots use. And I know Mike Newman, for example, uh, uh, uses one and less so on this. It's also, as a student pilot, if you don't want to do this or if it's overwhelming, call WX Brief. Say to them, I am a student glider pilot flying out of Sterling, Mass. I would like uh, an abbreviated briefing for the local area, say, for example, five, five miles around Sterling, any NOTAMs, TFRs, and, and basic weather report. They will work with you. They are more than happy to help student pilots learn how to get a verbal briefing by calling WX Brief. It can be a little scary the first time you call. Just give them the information. They may ask you what you're flying for an N number. Give them the Blanick or something like that that you're going to be flying. Uh, and they may not if you just say, I'm a student pilot flying with a Greater Boston Soaring Club. Um, some ask, some don't. The uh, iPad option, uh, in order for it to be official, actually requires pairing to an account on 1-800-WX-BRIEF. Uh, oh. they're, they're not a separate service. They're just connecting to this service for you. Okay, good to know. Yeah, correct, yes. Okay, so I'm going to log in now. Let me skip that. And it's thinking about it. It's still thinking. There it comes. And it comes up with a dashboard and some information and maps and weather and uh, density, altitude, and basically other things. Um, you can, down here, you can set up uh, airports that you wanna see. So for example, you can, I have in here Sterling, Worcester and Fitchburg. Uh, there's, there's no um, <coughs> TAF or Sterling or Fitchburg, but there is for Worcester. So that is a way to get started. What I really wanna do is go up here to plan and brief. And I wanna, I'm gonna click on plan and brief. And I usually screw this up a couple of times. So let's see what happens. And it's gonna come up with a big one. So I am flying my glider, EFR. Uh, if, you, if you don't know what it is, that's a schedule, it's other G general. general. Yeah, general, that's usually what I use. Number of aircraft. Uh, uh, if you're not sure about glider type, you can click on here. Uh, it'll give you some information, or you can do a search. And here, if you're not sure, you can just say glider. And hit return, and it says any manufacturer, just enter GLID. So I'll select that, and there it is. Weight turbulence, low, medium, high, aircraft equipment. Um, so... There's a huge long list here. A lot of times, you, you know, you could just say nil. Okay, it's an instructional flight. Uh, when I go up, I might put in ADSB out and things like that. Uh, departure, 3B3. And eventually I'll get an area brief, but I have to fill in when am I flying? So I'm gonna fly, let's say the 28th, which is tomorrow. And departure time, let's say 1100 Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, you can also put in minutes from now and so forth. I, you can leave off cruising speed, you can leave off level surveillance equipment. So I am just gonna click here on area brief. So essentially above this line is what you have to fill in to get in area brief. Hopefully I did that right, evidently I did. And this is all being recorded. Now it's gonna ask me, what do you want? And I usually want an abbreviated brief. 
uh, for adverse condi conditions, I want temporary flight closed on safe notums, just in case. I don't really care about convective sigmets, and I don't care about air mats except maybe low level wind shear, but I don't know what they mean by that. I'm not worried about icing mountains, IFR, etc. So I will click that. Uh, uh, I'm not concerned about pilot reports. I'm not concerned about center weather advisories because I've already looked at the weather. I'm not concerned about these. Certainly not volcanic ash. <laughs> uh, forecasts, cloud coverage, sure. Visibility, surface winds and precipitation, sure. Terminal area forecasts, yes. Winds aloft, yes. Area forecasts, yes. Uh, Notums for location, yes. Uh, I'm not concerned about navigation notums, communication or service notums, because uh, I'm just flying in the local area and my navigation is looking down and seeing the airport for instruction. I might be interested in obstruction, especially if they're putting up a new tower or something like that, a cell tower or a TV tower. Airspace, uh, I might, uh, and special use airspace. Um, especially if hand skimmer somebody is uh, doing something that they want to send an, uh, a notice out saying, hey, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of practice refueling of helicopters, you know, that might be worthwhile knowing. So, and I also have military. I don't care about flow control, um, anything like that. <clears throat> I'm not worried about uh, en route notums, and I'm not included about flight delay control notums. Uh, but I am, I might be concerned about security and airspace, especially if that airspace is closed due to uh, TFRs or something. And that's about it. Um, I am going to, You. I usually click on a PDF briefing and I download it and then I spend some time highlighting it and reading it. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a web briefing so that you can see what it looks like. So I'm going to click on that. It's being created. It's being logged for what I'm looking at. And I am going to say, okay, and here it comes. So here's my flight plan. I'm a glider. Uh, it's abbreviated area briefing within about 20 nautical, 25 nautical miles uh, for the uh, area, 50 nautical mile for winds aloft. Uh, it will include graphics and so forth and so forth. You're gonna need um, to click options up there because Firefox blocked the pop-up. Uh, where are you looking? At the just underneath the address bar, underneath the uh, under here, uh, right above the flight plan, it says options right above VFR. Yeah, right above VFR, Fred. Left. Right. Left. I see a mouse pointer. Move it left. Okay, I'm left. How? Your other you, left. Your other left. This left. No, no. <laughs> that's, that's still right. <laughs> the other left. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, okay. It's, it, it pop, yeah, yeah, it's Wait a second. Blocked. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. We can yep. we can see it, but it's being prevented from popping up. Go under chase where you have the button for chase. Chase. TD, yeah. chase, cap one, BOA, Bank of America, right under that. I don't see that either. I don't see it either. Oh, I'll, I'll oh, you know what? Oh, yeah. I know why. It's you know why? It's because it's a new share. I want to share this, which is here. Hold on. Share. How about that? Ah, oh, there we go. Yep. There okay. Go. It turned out it was sharing the wrong screen because this was a pop up. I get what you're yeah. doing. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I know on mine, it shows a green box be around what is being shared and it wasn't around this. And I thought, oh, different window. Okay, so here it is. This is this is the abbreviated briefing that I got for the parameters that I put in. And uh, as I said, 25 nautical miles, nautical miles per area, 50 nautical miles. And you can change this, you know, in, in your uh, parameters. I have it very limited because it's instructional. I don't need to go to or something like that. All right. Um, closed unsafe. Domestic notices and international notices. You can click on that. It turns out there aren't any. 
temporary flight restrictions, none. I am now covered because I looked and there are no temporary flight restrictions. I did it legally. I did it by key click and it's been logged that I looked for the time frame that I am in. Um, you get these weather maps of cloud coverage. Uh, they're fairly gener or generic for this area. Um, we already know a little bit about what the cloud coverage, so I actually skip over these. Visibility and winds, we already know from windy and others, so I tend to skip over those. This is the circle of the area that it's talking about for, for terminal area forecast. There's only one airport in that area that, that has a TAF for what I'm interested in, that's Worcester. I already printed it out, so this information is already there, I, and I don't care about Lawrence so much. Winds aloft, I already got from Windy as well. But uh, you again, you can, uh, this is the key for it. There's some information on here on how to read it. Uh, BDL is bet for, no, what? What's BDL guys, power pilot? Bradley. Bradley, Bradley thank you. And, and Boston, uh, sometimes I look at Albany because Albany, it comes from that direction, but there's Bradley in Boston. Uh, and you can read the key and go down. I already know what the winds are aloft again from Windy. Here's the notums. Uh, here's the Hanscom notice. Uh, this is a tower, which is that tower over by 290 on the other side of uh, Lake Winnip, uh, no, uh, Quint Lake Quinsigaman. And then there's a couple other towers down here. We're basically flying instruction in this area right here, so we don't have to worry about those. Uh, obstructions within 10 nautical miles. Um, there's, you can read this and figure out what it is. Fitchburg, you're talking 1,500 feet, uh, 250 feet above ground level. That's not something I'm going to worry about if it's over toward Worcester. That's, you know, I'm going to be landing out if that's the case. Uh, here's another one, 253 feet above uh, ground level at Fitchburg. Here's one at Sterling. This is the one uh, that's... Um, you can read it here, it's six nautical miles south, southeast. That's the one on the other side of Lake Quinsickaman and so forth. Pay attention to those, be aware of them. Those haven't changed for years. I keep expecting them to change the light at the top of this, but they don't. So I don't know what's going on. Um, you can scan down here, special use airspace. Uh, these are Hanscom, other obstructions. Um, you can read those. Again, mostly towers. A lot of them are cell phone towers or radio towers. Airspace, uh, you know, controlled airspace. You can read those. Special use airspace, there's none around us that's of concern. There's no graphic for military available, but you can read these things uh, here. A lot of them actually don't apply. They tell you how to get into Canada and so forth. And that's it. I have now done my legal duty. And I have we, one one thought on uh, distance from airport. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can have very different air weather, not from between two places, not too far apart. And I had yes. experienced being in a place where I had got the weather, and it was not even close to what I had gotten. But when that, I did a little looking, not yep. far from where I was, there had been a forecast for weather very different from what I was expecting. Yes. Uh, and so I like to look a little further away to see if there's something that might be close. Good point. Okay, good. I would say that's good for an advanced pilot, for a beginning pilot. Um, I'm more interested that you get the TFRs and the NOTAMs and your basic weather from other sources. Thank you. All right. That takes us now to the last couple things. We have any questions so far? Uh, just on the previous screen, um, you had the uh, the Fitchburg ASOS. So if you're yeah. coming back to the airport and you want to know what the winds are doing, at least at Fitchburg, you can dial in 135.175 and and get the get the current weather, automated weather at Fitchburg, which is sometimes useful. Yes, I would agree with that. With a a uh, fully rated pilot, not so much worried about it for a student pilot. However, to that point in my cockpit, I have a little sheet that has, so I don't have to look at the map or whatever. I just have a little sheet that says where I can get all the different weathers at the different airports. And that's just a little tag thing I have on the side of cockpit uh, in the uh, holder there. 
All right, let's go do something else here real quick so we can wrap this up. Uh, share screen again, and let's go to this one. This is the GBSC RASP, which um, I think, Pavola, you were the expert on this. Are you there? May not be there. No, okay. not on. Okay, so this is useful for predicting kind of a first prediction of what's it going to be like for soaring. I use this a lot. Uh, you notice it goes up north and south, east and west. Um, we're going to zoom in here to Sterling. And I'm going to show you the ones that I use for real quick. Friday, is it, is it going to be soarable? And let's, uh, I find this display a little bit confusing. So I just look at an individual. Anything that is pinkish to reddish or kind of look at my cursor over on the right, anything over here uh, in the green and above is reasonable thermal updraft velocity. And you notice that sterling is right here. Um, and, you know, it looks pretty good. If you click on the map, it advances the prediction by an hour. It gets better. It gets worse <laughs> by two o'clock. And by later afternoon, it dies off. So by four o'clock in the afternoon, it's pretty dead, according to this prediction. Let's go back to 11 o'clock. Buoyancy over shear. Buoyancy over shear is important to have a basic sense of. What it basically means is you could have fairly light thermals with minimal winds that are as workable as really terrific thermals with heavy winds. You will, you know, at some point you will get the same buoyancy over shear uh, ratio. So a buoyancy over shear ratio uh, of like four to five or better in at least one predictor or three and above here, uh, sort of basic green means it'll be, to me, workable. It's probably workable below that, but you're going to work at it. Above that, if you have a really good uh, buoyancy over shear, notice these are getting a little better, not much better. Uh, and then they fade off again by four o'clock in the afternoon or so. So tomorrow it looks like it's going to be flyable from just before noon till three or four o'clock. Let's take a look at Saturday, which is more interesting. Oh, buoyancy over sure looks pretty good at 11. And then it looks okay at 12. There's some green moving in there. So the buoyancy over sure looks pretty good. It looks like the thermals are going to be pretty good, but I think given the upper level winds, you're going to be working for them. You know, they could be blown apart. It may be turbulent and so forth. By what time? That's uh, five o'clock. They're going to be uh, scattered and disappearing. Uh, disappearing. Let's say one o'clock on Sunday. Uh, none. <laughs> it's yeah, going right. to be raining. <laughs> um, the other thing I look at is what's the critical height. So Friday, 11 o'clock. Now you got to keep in mind the critical height is 175 feet per minute lift. And most of the training gliders, that's probably good for them. For my glider under optimal conditions, it's probably a hundred feet per minute. So I can work this as any of the private owners can uh, a little better than what it's predicting. And so here it's saying the critical height is uh, probably looks to be about 3,500, maybe 4,000. It, in fact, could be higher than that in my glider because this would be good for a training glider, maybe less uh, in the, you know, whatever glider has a sink rate of 175 feet per minute, basically. Surface winds at noon tomorrow, early light. The direction corresponds to everything I've read. Boundary layer, again, pretty light. Saturday surface winds. Anything that's getting into the red, pay attention to. Not too bad on the ground. Uh, boundary layer, you're getting into the red. You're talking about 18 to 20 knots, maybe uh, a little higher. I'm not sure what they consider the boundary layer here. There's other things here that are useful. And this gets into the SKU-T, which we'll have a tutorial on later this year. 
this is the skew to for Friday at 11 what, o'clock. What, what, what is the term? Skew yeah. T. Um, uh, I don't know what it actually stands for. I guess I could say, somebody know what skew T actually stands for? I think I know. But yeah, know. The, uh, basically the temperature scale is skewed 45 degrees off to the right. If you look at the, uh, yep. you know, and 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 the uh, the y axis is basically logarithmic, so that's where the log p comes from. Okay. All right. So, eleven o'clock in the morning. Will there be thermals? The answer to me is yes, because the cooling rate of the atmosphere up to about three thousand thirty five hundred feet here. This is in feet above ground level. This is in uh, barometric pressure. <clears throat> um, is following a cooling curve that shows that the air is rising. Above about 4,000 feet, you have an, a very slight inversion. And so uh, the air will not rise much above that. It, it won't rise above that. The difference in the temperature here between the dew point and the rising air indicates that there may be clouds, but not many, uh, because the, the dew point and the rising air temperature have to match for the clouds to actually to condense out. That's at 11 o'clock in the morning. Let's check one o'clock in the afternoon. You notice that the height of the thermals has now increased to over 5,000 feet with a sharp uh, boundary layer here, probably still some clouds, but not over development because the two are not intersecting. Let's take a look at Saturday, 11 o'clock. All right, much closer. So there will be more clouds, but what is concerning to me is over here, which is the winds are now 20 knots. And then uh, at, at anything above ground level, which looks to be about 10 knots, they're up at about 20 knots. So that's, that's concerning. At one o'clock, um, worse conditions, um, slightly worse conditions, still very high winds, okay? Um, is it thermal flyable? Probably, but you know, until I get out there and check it out, uh, this sort of high wind doesn't make for easy to work thermals. They're probably being blown apart. They're probably there, but they're probably being blown apart. And if you go up to about here, it looks like if you come across 3,000 feet maximum for working the thermals, certainly no higher than about 3,500. And I have one more thing to show you. Let me bring this down a little bit so I can read it. Any questions on that? Play around with it is all I can say. Take a look at it. I think the answer is I've got don't even know which questions to ask. I need to. That's well, okay. You need to play yeah. around with it. That's right. Yeah. And then and then we'll have another tutorial on it later this summer. Now I'm going to log into here, which is SkySight. If you don't have an account, you can create one. And one of the things I like about SkySight is, you know, here's the area. It has, uh, you know, it's basically showing you uh, uh, airspace is on, showing you various things. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to set this timer here for noon. Did you put Shirley Airport in there or is it still showing Shirley Airport? It's showing it. I, I have nothing to do with that. Here's Sterling right here. Do not attempt to land there. It's a, yeah. it's a solar farm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to indicate, because this is how I mostly use SkySight for instructional and local filing. I use it differently when I go cross country. Point forecast. That will show up. Just click on the point. You want to know the forecast. So here it is for the 27th which is today. Was it soarable? Uh, three, 4,000 feet. You know, how about tomorrow? Um, three to 3,500, that's their prediction. I find them a little bit on the conservative. I find them conservative, let me just say that, uh, especially when I'm flying my glider. Let's take a look at Saturday. And 
this is interesting because this is where I disagree with the prediction that was in just the latest uh, GBSC weekly newsletter, which said it may be horrible on uh, Saturday afternoon. According to this, it's not. You know, it's not at all storable. I guess we'll find out. Hmm. That you know, the ceiling and um, winds, rain, and whatever may make it a boot point. Sunday, totally out of the question. Hmm. And then it doesn't get better until later in the week. But let's go back here to Friday and look down below. Has surface temperature as uh, dew points, winds, which all line up with everything I've read so far, which I've seen so far, and I don't care so much about the pressure here. Uh, but it's a really quick, easy way to say the sky size think it's going to be a horrible day. And I'll check it tomorrow morning to verify what it's saying tomorrow morning. And that's about it. So, so, so Fred, let me ask you if, if it, I mean, it seems very, very involved. If if for quick and dirty, would you say start off with aero weather and then go to sky site? For quick go... and dirty, huh? for pre-solo students, I would yeah. say skip all the GBSC RASP, skip the sky site, look at the basic weather, and try to get at least whether there's going to be any TFRs and NOTAMs. Okay. That's it. You know, okay. if you do that, I'll be happy. Once you're post-solo because you're going to be flying around on your own and you might be tempted to go a little bit further, okay? Uh, flying the 134 or something. And then I'm going to say, hey, you know, you might want to stay up for five hours and earn a certain badge or something like that. In that case, yeah, you better understand whether there's going to be thermals. Gotcha. But for now, I'm not worried about it. So I'm going to stop the sharing. Go back <laughs> here. I am going to... Stupid. Shut up, participants. Go to chat and <laughs> thank you, Doug. Doug says he ordered better weather for Sunday, but Nelson didn't listen. <laughs> okay. The nerve. Okay, I am still recording. Are there any last-minute questions or anything people would like to contribute? Was this useful? Just yeah. question: Is anybody yes. still using thermal index? No, I don't. Mm. Me neither. I find mm. it quite unreliable. It's often missing, and it's only you know one part of the day. Exactly. Okay, I am going to stop the recording. Well, wait. There was a future, maybe for a future topic. Um, Eric Forst has that app on Android. <laughs> <laughs> He now added that you can get weather brief and NOTAMs briefing. Yeah, yeah I was going to uh, do a, a presentation, sort of a follow-up to what Fred had here. Um, the app, for those that don't know about it, it, it combines a lot of uh, the information Fred had, um, uh, uh, RAS, um, 1-800-WX-BRIEF, um, yeah. Other stuff, windy. Yeah, great. <laughs> you know? so, so we'll try to keep yeah. these to one hour. So this is just about one hour now. Yeah. I got one yeah. minute to go. And I think that's a good tutorial time length. So I look forward actually, Eric, to your uh, presentation. And yeah. whenever you want to do it, I'll, I'll be there. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to okay. stop Thanks. the recording.